have the idea that quitting slows you down. It stops your progress. But in reality, quitting really speeds you up. And the reason that it speeds you up is because if you're engaged in something that isn't actually the best path for you to achieve the things that you want to achieve, then staying on that path, not quitting, is going to slow you down. Whereas if you actually quit and you switch to another path that is more likely to cause you to gain more ground, that will actually speed you up. So that's actually the number one reason why quitting can be so valuable. The second reason has to do with the fact that pretty much every decision we make is under the influence of two sources of uncertainty. The first is just pure luck. Like if I'm playing poker, I don't control the cards that are coming. Um, When you're driving on the road, you don't control the other cars that are driving around you. When you go into a, a new job, uh, you don't control like who might quit after you um, go there. You know, what new bosses might come in or new leadership might come in, how they might behave. The other influence is just hidden information. For most decisions we make, we know very little in comparison to all there is to be known. And inevitably, after we make a decision, we learn new information. And I think that we've all had that feeling of, oh gosh, if I had known then what I know now, I would have made a different decision. That's that sort of feeling of hidden information, new information revealing itself to you that would have changed your choice. And this is where quitting becomes so incredibly valuable because the option to quit is what makes it so that we can react to that new information. If we go even further than that, we can say that it also is what allows us to make decisions under uncertainty in the first place. Because when we learn that new information, we have the option to quit, it lets us do things like go on a date. Because imagine if the first date you ever went on, you had to marry that person. This is what allows us to do things like um, agile software development, for example, or A-B testing, or any of those things is that you have the option to quit the stuff that isn't working. And I think that this is what's so important about really understanding the value of quitting as a decision skill is it lets you deal with the uncertainty and it will actually get you to where you want to go faster. We can't perfectly see the future. Like we're not omniscient. Um, we don't have a crystal ball. Uh, it's hard for us to know exactly how other paths that we might be thinking about um, taking might turn out. Um, and so this makes that decision to quit really hard, like knowing exactly when is the right time. Now, if we were perfectly rational and omniscient, the exact time to quit is when uh, the expected value, when what you're getting out of the path you're on is no longer worthwhile, either on its own or in comparison to other paths that you might want to take. But the problem for us, of course, again, is that it's very hard to see that because that's a, a, a forecast, right? And we know that forecasts are uncertain. The thing that I try to tell people is that you should just assume that if you're thinking about quitting, it's already probably past the time that you should have quit. So there's really wonderful research from Stephen Levitt, the economist who wrote Freakonomics. He threw up a website and people who were struggling with big life decisions, like, should I quit my job? Should I leave my relationship, et cetera? Should I move to a new town? Should I stay or should I go? Should I quit or should I grit? Um, When they were in that moment of, I don't know, because it's really 50-50, I'm having trouble deciding, they could go to this website and the website would flip a virtual coin for them. Let's just understand from this setup that people who are willing to go flip a coin for a big life decision like this must really feel like it's a 50-50 choice, right? Otherwise, you know, the choice would be clear one way or the other. So given that, what you would assume is that The quitters here, the ones who are told to quit by the coin or who quit on their own, would be equally happy as the ones who are told to stay. But what he actually found when he measured the happiness of the coin flippers two months and six months later was that the quitters were happier. And so what that shows is that that moment when people felt it was 50-50, it was actually well past 50-50. This is sort of the problem that we have. We need much more signal than you actually need in terms of when the right time to quit would actually be. If we think about grit and we think about quit, people, I think, view those as opposing forces. 
right? And in the battle, at least of the popular mind, grit is the clear winner. Grit is a virtue. It's building character, right? It's a sign of character, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, we admire those who persevere. Um, whereas quitting is clearly a vice, at least as people sort of view it. Um, it shows that you're weak-willed. And we can see this like, you know, reflected in all of these aphorisms, like winners never quit and quitters never win. That's kind of how we think about that in terms of the battle between the two. But in reality, grit and quit are the exact same decision if you think about it, right? Because if I choose to stick to something, that means I'm choosing not to abandon course. And if I choose to walk away from something, it means I'm choosing not to stick to it. So really they're, they're literally the exact same decision, okay? So if we know that there are certainly circumstances under which quitting would be correct, as an example, I'm at the top of Mount Everest and there's a snowstorm, I should probably quit my summit attempt and, and that would be the wise thing to do. Then the flip side has to be true that sometimes sticking it out or gritting it out can't possibly be correct either. And those circumstances are, are in particular when the path you're on is no longer worthwhile. It's not worth you doing. Now, the value of grit is that it gets you to stick to worthwhile things that are also hard. Most things that are really worthwhile doing are going to be hard also. We want to stick to those worthwhile things even when we're in down periods. When grit is really great is when it's getting to you to stick to something that really is going to get you to get to your goal. The issue is that it also gets you to do that when the end goal is no longer worth pursuing. When, when there's other paths that you could take, which would actually get you to where you want to go faster. There's a few problems with quit while you're ahead. All right. The first is that what makes a path worth sticking to is not whether you're like ahead right at this moment. So let's say that I bought a stock and I bought it at 50 uh, and it's now at 60. So I'm ahead. But that's not what actually tells me whether I should stick to it. What tells me whether I should stick to it is whether going forward, I feel that this is a stock that's a good position to be in or not. Is this a good place for you to, to have your money versus other places that you could invest your money? Quit while you're ahead is getting you to focus on the wrong thing because it's not telling you what ahead means. But the bigger problem with that aphorism is that it's amplifying a bias that we have, a cognitive bias that we have that's actually quite bad. So for most things, particularly when we get bad news, we have a tendency to quit too late. There is one place where we tend to quit too early, and that is exactly when we're ahead. To sort of get this idea across, um, I'd love to talk about uh, for a second, a study that was done by Colin Kammerer and many colleagues, including Richard Thaler, who's a Nobel laureate. And what they did was they looked at a, a plethora of trip sheets of New York City cab drivers. And what he found was a very interesting pattern, which was that when the driving conditions were really good, the cab drivers were quitting really early in their shift. And under bad conditions, when there weren't a lot of fares to pick up, they were staying in the cab and, and sticking really long. Now, I hope that you can see that this is the opposite of what you would do in an ideal world. When the driving is really good, when there's lots of fares around, um, just in terms of maximizing your income, one would think that you would stay in the cab and keep driving because there's so many fares to be picked up. And when there aren't a lot of fares around, you would just say, oh, you know, today is not a good day. I'm not going to take my time doing this. I'm going to quit and I'll come back another day when maybe the fare conditions are better. So the cab drivers have flipped their behavior. It turned out that most of the drivers had set an earnings goal for the day. If you hit your earnings goal really fast, that's exactly the circumstances under which it means that there's lots of fares around, but they've hit their earnings goal. So now they're ahead and they quit. But when the driving was bad, they didn't hit that earnings goal and they kept driving around in their cab trying to get to whatever their goal was in terms of their daily earnings. They stuck while they were behind and they quit while they were ahead costing them a lot of money. And it turns out that this is actually a very strong human tendency that when things aren't going well for us, we tend to escalate our commitment to the cause. But when things are going really well, like you have a stock at 60 instead of 50, you know, that you bought at 50, then we want to get out of it right away.
When we're thinking about businesses and leadership um, and how leadership should be thinking about these quitting problems, right? What we need to realize is that cab drivers, people in the stock market, people climbing Mount Everest and continuing on till the summer, even after conditions have turned really bad on them. Um, any of the, the sort of stories that we hear about, like people clearly sort of quitting too late, that this is repeating across your organization. Every employee has these tendencies because these tendencies are really embedded cognitive biases. And in particular, one of the things that we want to think about is called the sunk cost effect. Um, and the issue there is that we tend to take into account resources that we've already spent when we're thinking about whether to spend more on a project. So you'll hear people say, you know, well, if I quit now, I'll have wasted my time. Uh, so that's a, just a sunk cost fallacy problem because uh, the time that you've already spent is gone. What matters is, are you wasting more time by continuing with the project? Um, and then the other thing that we need to understand, and this is particularly important for leadership, is that uh, when people are considering quitting or not, there's issues that have to do with what we call internal validity and external validity. So internal validity is basically how am I going to view myself, right? Am I going to view myself as having wasted my own time? Or am I going to view myself as having been inconsistent? How am I going to feel about myself, right? And we think about issues of external validity. It's thinking about how are other people going to judge us? When we're thinking as leaders about this, what we need to understand is that people have these biases, which means that... Um, they're going to be uh, quitting too late in general. They're going to be recommending that projects get shut down too late. Why? Because of this fear of waste and because of the fear of the career risk that's associated with quitting something. And if people are afraid of quitting until it's so certain that that's the only choice, which is well beyond the point at which they should have walked away, that's a problem for you as an organization. So one of the things that I try to get people to really think about is something that comes from poker. So in poker, we used to remind ourselves, you know, professionals, that poker is one long game. It was advice that I was given like when I was really a new player. What it meant was that over the course of all the hands that I might play, over my whole lifetime. I wanted to make sure that I was investing my resources, my money and my time and my attention into the hands that were going to, in the long run, make me the most money. And what that meant is how I might feel on a particular hand at the moment that I might have to fold it should matter very little. I shouldn't be thinking about, oh, but I already have money in the pot because that doesn't really matter. What matters is, is the next chip that I'm going to put in the pot going to make money? right? It shouldn't matter that I'm worried how people are going to perceive me for folding, for example, because people do sometimes make fun of you for folding at a poker table, believe it or not. When I'm in a poker game, I shouldn't be like the cab drivers, for example. And I shouldn't say, well, if I make this amount of money in the game, I'm going to, I'm going to quit. What I should say is I'm going to play as long as I feel like I'm playing really well. What matters is how I do in the long run over time, because poker is one long game and life is one long game. In order to play the game of poker or play the game of life well, you have to quit in those situations, particularly those situations where other people might not. So poker players find it very hard to quit games when they're losing. You have to be willing to do that so that you can get yourself in a better position later. People don't want to quit projects for the same reason. You as leadership have to remind them that it's one long game. It's also really important for you to realize how you might be exacerbating that particular bias, the unwillingness of people to walk away from things. And how might you be doing that? Well, if you judge people solely by their outcome, did you finish the project? Did you complete it? Well, maybe it wasn't a project that was worth completing. If you have a bad outcome, which is generally something like missed a sales target or you didn't complete a project on time, you end up in a postmortem where people might be saying like, well, what I'm really concerned about is the process that led us here, but you're only there because you had a bad outcome. You're only there because you missed a target or you missed a date or you missed, you know, a sales number at the end of Q3 and your employees hear that. And what they know is that I am being judged for whether I finish things. I am being judged for whether I hit the target. And as much as they're telling me that they care about the process, when I'm in a room defending myself, it's when I've missed. And that's going to create behavior in the people who work for you where they don't want to quit things. Mm -hmm. 
The thing that surprised me the most in the writing of this book was the discovery very much through the work of Marie Schweitzer and his colleagues, Marie Schweitzer from the Wharton School, um, was that goals really have a downside. So I, I think like most people kind of thought about goals as just a positive, right? Like you set a very clear target and you head toward that target and that's very motivating. And I think that's the way that most people feel about goals, but goals get you to head toward a finish line kind of come what may. There's a very well-known case uh, from 2000, the 2019 London Marathon of Siobhan O'Keefe. Um, she starts to experience pretty bad pain uh, somewhere around mile three. Um, on mile eight, her fibula snaps. <laughs> okay, so she literally breaks her leg. She kept running all the way to the finish line in excruciating pain and obviously, obviously putting her, her you know, the chances that she runs another marathon in her life at risk. Now, the thing about Siobhan O'Keefe is that she's not even that unusual. In the same marathon, someone broke their ankle right around the same point and also finished that marathon. And the reason why they don't stop is because there's a finish line. I mean, think about it, right? Like if you run 13.1 miles in the context of a marathon, you have failed because you didn't reach the 26.2 line, you know, mile marker. But if you run 13.1 miles in a, the context of a half marathon, you have succeeded. What happens is that once we've set that finish line, anything short of that goal is failure because we really kind of grade the achievement of goals as pass fail in nature. And so we just keep going and it causes us to ignore very clear signals from the world, like a broken bone that we should be quitting. It just makes us ignore it. And I think this is the thing that we need to realize about goals, that they can get us to behave in ways that make us keep going toward the summit in a snowstorm or well past the turnaround time. It causes people to drive businesses into the ground, it causes people to stay in really bad relationships. It causes people to stay in jobs that aren't going well, to stick to projects that they shouldn't be sticking to, because there are goals associated with all of those, and we can't quit them once we set them. So the thing that you need to do whenever you set a goal is have a set of unlesses that go along with that. I'm going to go toward this finish line unless. What is the unless I break a bone for any goal that you set?